Good evening, folks. How's everyone tonight? Well, audio? Okay. There we go. How's that? Better? All right. Well, again, welcome to, welcome to the uh, lecture series tonight for, uh, what is this, February of 07. Um, tonight's talk is about NASA's next venture into the solar system, which is the ambitious and exciting Dawn mission planned for launch in June of this year. The spacecraft will orbit both Ceres and Vesta, which are the two most massive residents of the asteroid belt and among the last unexplored worlds in the inner solar system. Tonight's speaker grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and, her, and earned an A.B. in physics from Princeton University, an M.S. in physics from the University of Colorado in Boulder, and his Ph.D. from the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics. He then combined his scientific training with his lifelong study and interest in the exploration of space by joining NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 1986. His work there has spanned a broad range, including optical interferometry missions for detecting planets around other stars, a Mars sample return mission, a Mars laser altimeter, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the development of systems to use lasers instead of radios to communicate with interplanetary spacecraft. In 1994, he helped initiate a new NASA program to characterize highly advanced and risky technologies for future space missions by flying them on dedicated test flights. The first mission of this new Millennium program, Deep Space One, was launched in October of 1998, on which he worked from its inception in 1995 to its conclusion in 2001. During the course of the project, he served as chief mission engineer, mission director, and ultimately project manager. Today, he serves as project systems engineer for the Dawn mission, which builds upon the technologies tested with the Deep Space One mission. A recipient of numerous honors and awards, a unique honor was bestowed upon him when, in recognition of his many contributions to space exploration, an asteroid was named after him. He is an avid collector of space memorabilia from over 40 nations, has written articles on all manner of space exploration, has, uh, let's see, has a digitally animated alter ego that lives on NASA's educational website called The Space Place, has a black belt in karate, enjoys photography, hiking, cross-country skiing, international folk dancing, and the list goes on. So in the interest of time, let me please just introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Mark Raymond. Well, thank you. I appreciate your coming. I appreciate your interest, um, both the people who are here in the room and on the webcast. Um, for those of you on the webcast, you won't be getting the, uh, all the free money and fabulous prizes that have been given to the people <laughs> who came here to the room, but, um, but I hope you'll enjoy the talk anyway. <clears throat> so let's get started. I'm going to tell you about the Dawn mission, as you heard, uh, and this is being led by JPL, which is managed by Caltech for NASA. But the project has collaborators from many organizations around the country, including UCLA and Orbital Sciences Corporation, as well as around the world uh, with particular contributions from Germany and Italy and collaboration from other countries as well. So before I tell you about Dawn specifically, I want to take you back in time a little bit to 1800. And if we could bring the lights down a little bit so you can see this nice diagram which was made for me by Dr. Paul Chodas from JPL. <clears throat> Excuse me. These were the planets that were known in 1800. Uh, the sun is here in the center and it's surrounded by in the center Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. And although these are the planets that were known in 1800, the positions of these planets are actually what they are today, February 22nd of 2007. And so it's interesting to note, here's the sun and here's the Earth, and Saturn is directly opposite the sun. And so if it weren't raining tonight, you could go outside and at about midnight, Saturn would be overhead, just opposite the sun. And early in the morning, you can see Jupiter as it's rising. Earth, of course, rotates counterclockwise in this view. It rotates this direction. So if you were standing on Earth, Jupiter would come up before the sun would. So anyway, these were the planets that were known in 1800. Uh, of course, the inner planets, Mercury through Saturn, had been known to ancient astronomers. It wasn't until uh, 1781 that the planet Uranus was discovered. So this was the content of the solar system. Then along came this fellow, Giuseppe Piazzi, uh, a mathematician and astronomer. And he got the new year 1801 off to a nice start by discovering a new planet. And so uh, for a 
a relatively poorly populated solar system, this was a pretty impressive accomplishment. And here's a high resolution image of what he found, that is Ceres, named it after the goddess of agriculture and grain. And this goddess is often depicted with grains here and ears of corn on her head. And in fact, if you had cereal this morning, you would owe a, a debt of etymological gratitude to Ceres. So this was the name that was given to the planet that he discovered. And here again is the chart I just showed you. So these are the planets known in 1800. And then in 1801, Ceres was added. And it filled this nice gap here between Mars and Jupiter. And in fact, Ceres was considered a planet for about 50 years or so after it was discovered. Well, shortly after Piazzi's discovery, along comes another fine gentleman, Heinrich Olbers, who was trained as a physician but uh, was a very accomplished and productive astronomer as well. And the very next year, in 1802, he discovered another new planet. And more importantly for the topic that I want to tell you about today, in 1807, he discovered still another one. And by then, it was the fourth new planet that had been discovered in this region between Mars and Jupiter. And it was called Vesta. Uh, she's the goddess of the hearth, home, and family. It's a goddess who relatively little is known about in Roman mythology. Uh, in fact, she is rarely depicted, although when she is, it's always with sort of a stern face. And for much of what we understand about Roman religion, she was worshipped in private in the home. Anyway, so this was the name given to the second body that Olbers discovered, the fourth in that part of the solar system. And so now I've zoomed in a little bit. So now the largest orbit you see here is Jupiter. Here's the orbit of Mars. And now included the orbits of both Vesta and Ceres. And these bodies plus the other two that were discovered in that time between 1801 and 1807, which I'm not depicting here, uh, remained the known planets. Uh, this, this remained the known set of planets for about half a century. But then as technology advanced, people started discovering still more bodies in this region between Mars and Jupiter. And now it looks something more like this, where, of course, I'm not showing the individual orbits of all of these bodies, just the dots to indicate the bodies that are there, where they are today. And I think the people in the front row at least probably can tell there are 10,320 <laughs> dots located around here. In fact, there are more asteroids than that, but um, Paul Chodas, again, who was kind enough to make the chart for me, cut it off there so that you wouldn't lose Vesta and Ceres in an extremely dense field of, field of dots. So what, what's going on here? What, what is it? Obviously, there's something different about this region of the solar system in which Vesta and Ceres are embedded from parts of the solar system that perhaps more, we're more familiar with. So let's take a look at what's happening here. Let's go back a little bit before Piazzi by 4.6 billion years, in fact, to the dawn of the solar system. And our solar system is believed to have begun in a vast cloud of gas and dust. <clears throat> and uh, it's similar to what's shown in this Hubble Space Telescope photograph of the Trifid Nebula, an object in the constellation Sagittarius that perhaps you've even seen if you have a telescope. And what's happening here is this was a large cloud of gas and dust. And off the, off the picture, here is a bright star which is shining down on this cloud. And it's actually blowing material away. It's, it's evaporating it, pushing it away. And for example, here in this little nub is a star that's forming in this dense cloud of gas and dust. And this is the shadow of the much brighter and more powerful star that's out of the field of view. And so the star that's up here is, is not able to evaporate the material here because this is casting a shadow. And so inside here, a star is forming. And we believe that this is very similar to the conditions four and a half billion years ago when our sun formed. And now once the star has formed in here, then the system can begin making planets. And here's a recipe for making planets. There's a lot of gas and dust here. And 
particles of dust collide and stick together. In fact, you can see something like that happening right here. And in this case, it's building up words, but in the real system, these particles of dust stick together and form rocks, and the rocks stick together, and they're, the larger they get, the more gravity they have. They pull in and can form planets. But when Jupiter formed with its massive gravity, with its large gravity, it interrupted this process in the nearby asteroid belt. And so the material that's in the asteroid belt wasn't given the opportunity to finish coalescing into a planet. It didn't get to accrete into a planet. And so it's, it's the remnant from that time. And Ceres and Vesta, the targets that we're interested in for dawn, got large enough to at least be considered protoplanetary remnants. They're larger than the other bodies in the asteroid belt. They're sort of like planetary embryos. And the mission of Dawn is to go to the asteroid belt and study those two objects. So let's focus now on what the specific scientific motivation is. We want to compare Ceres and Vesta so that we can understand more about the conditions and the processes that were acting at the dawn of the solar system. And these are the two most massive bodies in the asteroid belt. And that's important because many of the asteroids get scattered around, moved to other locations, but because these guys are the biggest, it's believed that they haven't moved very much from the location in which they were created. And so they'll help us understand what the conditions were at their exact locations. And although, as you saw, they're at similar distances from the sun, they took very different courses through the, the history of the solar system. Vesta, after it was formed, became very hot. And in fact, its surface appears to be covered with something that looks very much like lava. And it's dry. There's, there's very little evidence or evidence of very little water at Vesta. Whereas Ceres, in contrast, just a little bit farther from the sun, apparently never got very hot. It remained cool and is believed to have retained water. So why it is that these two bodies that formed in such similar locations are so different is part of what's interesting about uh, the objectives that Dawn wants to understand. And some people like to describe these two bodies as straddling a sort of dew line in the solar system, with Vesta being a little bit closer to the sun and resembling much more the inner rocky bodies of the solar system, one of which is just under our feet, Earth, as well as Mercury, Venus, the Moon, and Mars, whereas Ceres, remaining cool, retaining water, being more like the icy moons of the outer solar system, that is Jupiter and Saturn in particular, have a large retinue of moons that, uh, that are believed to be similar in structure and composition to Ceres. So let's take a, a look now at the size of these two bodies. Vesta is uh, almost 600 kilometers, or about 350 miles in diameter. Ceres, the largest asteroid, is nearly 1,000 kilometers, or almost 600 miles in diameter. So these are big bodies. I think most people think of asteroids as sort of little chips of rock, but, but these aren't. These are pretty big. And to put that in context, this is an image, which I hope you can see, of the largest asteroid which a spacecraft has yet visited. It's called Asteroid Matilda. Excuse me, and as you can see, it's entirely different in scale from something like Vesta and Ceres. And so, as you heard in the introduction, I, I think of Vesta and Ceres as among the last unexplored worlds in the inner solar system. These are big places. And in fact, they're much more like planetary sized bodies in context. And to give you something else of a familiar scale, <laughs> you can see here. But you can see these are large places. Um, it's also interesting to note, I, I presume most people recall from last summer, the controversy which occurred both in the scientific community and in the popular press over the designation of Pluto and its demotion, as some people would say, from being a planet to being a dwarf planet. Well, once it, once it was defined as a dwarf planet, the definition that was applied, it turns out, also applies to Ceres. So when Pluto was given this new classification as dwarf planet, Ceres received the same classification. And in fact, Dawn is actually going to be the first mission to a dwarf planet. Uh, it's also, I think, interesting to note that 
I told you a few minutes ago that uh, after Ceres was discovered, or when it was discovered, it was considered a planet for about 50 years. Pluto was discovered in 1930 and was considered by the official astronomical community to be a planet until 2006. And so really they spent comparable amounts of time designated as planets before their classifications were changed. Now when you look at a picture like this, particularly comparing it with flat California, this is a little bit deceptive because of course these bodies are three-dimensional, they're round, and so there's a lot more surface area on Vesta or on Ceres than you might think by comparing it with this flattened view of California. So if we take a more three-dimensional look, this is to scale the continental United States and a map of Ceres. This is color-coded to indicate something about how reflective or how bright the surface is. And uh, the data that we have don't go all the way to the South Pole here at minus 90 degrees or the North Pole at plus 90. But the area inside this white rectangle shows that the surface area of Ceres is actually about 40% of the surface area of the United States. And if you just think about how vast and varied the the topography and geology of our country is, there's a lot to see there. And I think there's going to be a lot to see at Ceres. I think it's really going to hold a lot of interesting surprises and a, a lot of opportunity for great variety. OK, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's just take a little bit more careful look at these two targets. This is Ceres as viewed by the Hubble Space Telescope advanced camera for surveys, <clears throat> excuse me, showing it rotating. And you can see it certainly looks much like a planet. And on the right here are a couple of different uh, interpretations scientists have of what the interior of Ceres might be like. And you can see there's a large core of rock and ice. And at the top, there's ice. But interestingly, somebody's being called, and maybe they want to tell us something about Ceres. But interestingly, in the view on the right, it's possible that Ceres has a subsurface ocean. Actually, liquid water may exist under the ice cap at Ceres, a particularly intriguing possibility. And so one of the things that we want to understand when we go to Ceres is what indeed is the interior like, and is it possible that it has retained water from the time it was formed? This is now Vesta. Here's a view from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is just a smoothed model, a little bit more pleasant to look at. Here you can see it obviously is not nearly as spherical as Ceres is. This part looks like it is. And you can sort of imagine filling it in to make a, a nice, more uniform sphere here. But there's something going on here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what we believe this is is an impact crater with a big central peak. Now, many large impact craters in the solar system have a peak like that. The reason is you form an impact crater when you have this solar system body and a big meteoroid slams into it, imparts so much energy to it that the surface actually, that the rocks actually melt, and so they slosh away from the impact, and then they slosh back together and freeze. Okay? And so that's why many impact craters have a large peak in them. And this bottom view here is a admittedly crude topographical map of Vesta, where now it's been rotated a little bit. So this peak here is tipped forward toward us a little bit. And the distance, the elevation distance from this central peak to the area down here is more than 10 miles. So 10 miles from the bottom of this crater to the top. And the diameter of this crater is 460 kilometers, or about 300 miles. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's 80% of the diameter of the entire body. And it's so deep that it's believed that it penetrated the crust of the of Vesta and may expose the mantle, that is the material underneath the crust. And so the opportunity to peek into that crater, besides just thinking about how cool the topography would be and how neat it would be to see this, the opportunity to see into the mantle of a solar system body may be 
if not unique, at least very rare. And so I think both Vesta and Ceres hold a, a lot of opportunity for us to see some really exciting sites. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now that we know where we're going, oh, should also forgot to include this artist concept of the formation of this crater. So there's a an impact on now Vesta with this large uh, crater here at the South Pole. So now a lot of this material is sprayed out into the solar system, and. It's the orbits of these individual bodies are perturbed by planets, and some of it may actually make its way into the inner solar system where you and I live. And in fact, we know, for reasons that I'll tell you in just a second, that this has happened. And so if you've ever been out, in the, looked at the night sky and seen a meteor, you know that's a particle of debris that's come into the atmosphere and burned up, and sometimes that's actually from Vesta. And uh, sometimes those materials, that material will make its way down to the surface of the Earth. And in fact, here's a meteorite, uh, which I photographed myself in a museum, that's known to come from Vesta. So maybe you've heard that we have meteorite samples on Earth, a very small number, that are known to come from Mars and the Moon. But about 5%, that's 1 in 20, of the meteorites that have been found on Earth are known to come from, or believed to come from, Vesta. So the Moon, Mars, and Vesta are the only solar system bodies to which we've actually linked specific meteorites, and more of them have been linked to Vesta than to any other place. And so we've got a lot of samples of Vesta here on Earth, or at least that's what we believe to be the case. So now we'd like to, having studied those, go to Vesta and look at these samples, look at the the material in its geological context to understand still more about how this picture fits together and what it tells us about the origin of the solar system. So here's the itinerary. We're going to depart most people's favorite planet this summer in June or July. And then on our way out, the solar system will fly by Mars in March of 2009 as we head out to the asteroid belt. Then we'll arrive at Vesta late in 2011, we'll go into orbit around it, and we'll spend a little bit more than half a year there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we'll leave Vesta, travel almost an additional three years to reach Ceres. And at each of these targets, Vesta and Ceres, we'll make a comprehensive set of measurements. We'll get color photographs. Everybody likes to see that, of course. We'll also compile a topographical map. That'll be interesting both here at the south polar crater at Vesta, and that'll tell us a lot about whether or not Ceres really is composed of water and ice. We'll map the elemental and mineralogical composition, that is, what are the individual elements that make up these bodies, and how do they combine to form rocks and minerals. We'll measure the gravity field, which will tell us something about the interior structure of the bodies, and we'll search for moons. And so with this comprehensive set of measurements on two different bodies, it really makes Dawn truly unique because this is a mission of comparative planetology. And we have never before attempted to send a spacecraft into the solar system to orbit two different bodies. But why is that? Scientists have been interested in a mission like this for many, many years. But why is it that We've never tried something like this before, never tried to orbit two bodies. Well, I'm glad you're wondering why it is, because I'm going to tell you. And that is, until very recently, engineers and scientists who wanted to do this were confronted with a problem. And they're confronted with the same problem that these two gentlemen have. That is, we just don't have the technology to carry it out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's, let's take a look, another look at the solar system and try to understand why that is. Here again is the same picture I showed you before, the orbits of the planets. And, oh, and I didn't mention earlier that uh, we talked about where you could see Jupiter and Saturn. Now that we have this zoomed in view, you can also see Venus setting in the evening sky, at least when it's not cloudy like it is today, setting in the evening sky just shortly after the sun does because Venus, as viewed from Earth, isn't that far here from the sun. But <clears throat> back to the problem at hand here, we want to get from Earth way out, even past Mars, 
to catch up with asteroid Vesta. That's a long way to go. And I think people often don't appreciate that it's much more difficult to go into orbit around a distant solar system body than it is just to fly by it. Because we have to get the spacecraft way out here, and then we have to match Vesta's orbit around the sun. So we have to send a spacecraft out here, in some sense sort of stop where Vesta is, and then go around the sun with it. That takes a lot of maneuvering by the spacecraft. But it's more difficult than that, because once it's done that, then the spacecraft on its own, without the help of a rocket, has to leave Vesta and travel to still another part of the solar system, get out to Ceres, and then do the same thing there. It has to travel out to Ceres, stop there, and go into orbit and follow it around the sun. And it turns out it's more difficult to get into orbit around bodies that don't have a large gravity. So when we send spacecraft, for example, to Mars or Jupiter, the gravity of those planets in some sense helps pull the spacecraft in and bring it into orbit. And while we saw Vesta and Ceres are the largest asteroids, they still don't have enough gravity really to help this process very much. And so that means the spacecraft has to do a lot of the work. But it's still more difficult even than that. And to understand why, I want to give you a different perspective. Here we're sort of looking down on the solar system. I want to now switch views so we'll be looking in the same plane as most of, these, most of the planets are orbiting. And we'll look from down here. So now you can see here's the orbit of Jupiter and the other planets are all in here, nearly in the same plane. But Vesta and Ceres are not. You can see their orbits are tipped. And it turns out it's very difficult to change the plane of the spacecraft's orbit around the sun. And you can understand that by imagining that if you're driving in a car at very, very high speed and you try to turn, well, I should remind you, when the spacecraft starts at Earth, it's going at high speed because Earth is zooming around the sun. Now we want to turn the orbit, tip it like that. When you turn your car, unless you have a banked road, you have to slow down, put on the brakes, turn, and then speed back up. Well, all of that work, the putting on the brakes and the speeding back up, all that sort of thing has to be done by the spacecraft. And so all of this getting out to the this distant part of the solar system, stopping there, meeting up with the body, changing into its orbit around the sun, tipping the orbit. That takes a lot of maneuvering by the spacecraft. And again, until recently, we simply haven't had the technology to do it. And so the question that we've asked is simply, how can we travel around the solar system more easily and less expensively? And the answer to that, which is familiar to many science fiction buffs, is ion propulsion. And without it, we simply would not be able to do a mission like Dawn. Now, if you're like me, and I know some of you are, the first time you ever heard of ion propulsion was in science fiction. In fact, the Star Wars TIE fighter, TIE means twin ion engine. And the first time I ever heard of ion propulsion actually was in Star Trek, the original series. And there are several episodes that refer to ion propulsion, one in particular where Mr. Spock, uh, in describing an alien ship, refers to the ion propulsion as ad high technology, advanced technology, high velocity. Uh, Scotty sort of drools over this incredibly cool ship and says they could teach the Enterprise a thing or two. And Captain Kirk points out that advanced ion propulsion is beyond even our capability. And so, so ion propulsion is been in the, the world of science fiction for a long time. And part of the reward of many of us working at a place like JPL is getting to turn that science fiction into science fact. So let's take a look at the fact of ion propulsion. Let me first remind you how a conventional propulsion system works. You take a gas and you heat it up or you put it under pressure and you push it out of a rocket nozzle and the action of the gas leaving the nozzle causes a reaction that pushes the spacecraft in the other direction. And it's much the same thing happens if you have a balloon and you let go of the, the open end as the air is pushed out from the, the pressure of the, the elastic in the balloon. The air being pushed out is what pushes the balloon in the other direction. 
Well, ion propulsion works the same way, but we don't heat the gas up or we don't put it under pressure. First of all, we begin with the gas xenon, which is like helium or neon, but heavier. And we introduce it into a chamber here, which is about a foot or so in diameter. And then we bombard it with electrons. This is very much like the electrons in your television set that, uh, that, that light up the screen. And perhaps you recall that atoms, of one kind of which is xenon, consist of a core of positively charged protons along with some neutrons surrounded by a sort of a cloud of electrons. And there are just exactly as many positive protons as there are negative electrons, so it's electrically neutral. But when one of these electrons hits a xenon atom, it'll knock off an electron. So this electron goes this way and it knocks another one off. So now we have an imbalance. There's one fewer electrons than protons, and so we're left with a net positive charge, and that's called an ion. And the importance of this is when it's ionized or charged, it can respond to a voltage. It can feel the effect of a voltage. And so we have two grids here that are separated by just a very small amount, um, about um, six or ten times the thickness of a human hair. We put a large voltage on them, and they accelerate the xenon ions and shoot them out to the right at very high speed, 35 kilometers per second, or well over 70,000 miles per hour. And the action of every ion going off to the right causes a reaction that pushes the thruster and the spacecraft that it's attached to to the left. And so that's how the ion propulsion works. We shoot these xenon ions to the right, and they push the spacecraft to the left. And here's a photograph of a thruster operating in a vacuum chamber, and it does produce this nice sort of blue or bluish green glow like you see in the science fiction movies. And the reason for that is it glows blue, xenon glows blue just as neon in neon lights glows orange. Now, the trick is that the, although this is extremely efficient, uh, the thrust is very low. And the reason for that is we flow just a very small amount of xenon through the thruster at any one time. In fact, we flow so little through that it would take, uh, take days to use up just a pound of propellant. But it's very, very efficient. And in fact, I brought a prop here, and you can, uh, I'm going to show you how to do an ion propulsion experiment at home. That is, the ion thruster pushes on the spacecraft as hard as this single piece of paper pushes on my hand. So it's fantastically gentle. But over time, the effect of this thrust can build up. So instead of thrusting like most planetary spacecraft do for a few minutes at a time with its engine, a thruster like this will operate for months or even years at a time. And gradually, the effect of this thrust will build up. Uh, it would take a spacecraft like Dawn four days to go from zero to 60 miles per hour. So it's not exactly a hot rod. But we don't thrust for four days. If, we, if you imagine thrusting for 40 days or 400 days or 4,000 days, you can build up to fantastically high speeds. And so it's what I like to call acceleration with patience. <clears throat> and as an illustration of the benefit of the ion propulsion by being so efficient, being so parsimonious in its use of propellant. JPL has a number of spacecraft in orbit around Mars. There is even a model of one back there. And when these spacecraft get to Mars, they have to execute a burn with their engine to be captured into orbit. And a maneuver like that typically may consume something like 280 or so kilograms. That's about 600 pounds of propellant. And that's propellant that you and I, as taxpayers, have to pay to lift off the Earth on a rocket in order to get it out to Mars. Well, a spacecraft like Dawn with ion propulsion could execute the same maneuver using just a little more than 20 kilograms or less than 50 pounds of propellant, a substantial savings. On the other hand, the Mars missions make a maneuver like that in maybe 20 minutes or so, and that's enough to change their velocity by almost by about 2,000 miles per hour. Spacecraft like Dawn would take three and a half months to do it. But if you have the time, and I do, I'm not in a hurry, then it's a really efficient way to travel around the solar system. <clears throat>
And so this is really the key to enabling a mission like Dawn. <clears throat> now, there's, uh, I mentioned that the ion propulsion has been around for a long time. There's some people who believe that it's been around a very long time. I'm not sure <laughs> that's actually really true. But, uh, but the first, first mission to really get off the ground with it is Deep Space One, which you heard about in the introduction. And the primary purpose of Deep Space One was to test high-risk advanced technologies like ion propulsion so that science missions like Dawn could use them with confidence so that we, the, the people working on answering the scientific questions wouldn't have to solve the many engineering questions associated with using a new technology like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Dawn, uh, Deep Space One, was launched in 1998. It had a very successful mission testing the technology. It also went on and conducted a, a very successful science mission of its own. Turns out that a mission is perhaps not as well known as many others because it's, uh, it achieved its accomplishments in September of 2001 when news was focused on other topics. But, but for the purposes of this talk, what really counts is uh, Deep Space One having tested the ion propulsion. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, shortly after it was launched, it extended its solar arrays. We checked out the spacecraft, and as it left the Earth and Moon behind, turned on the ion propulsion system and checked it out, understood how it worked, uh, and solved all of the problems that would need to be solved for a subsequent mission to count on it. And we ended up thrusting with the ion propulsion system on dawn for about 680 days, so the longest powered flight ever conducted. But that's an artist's concept. I wanted to show you my favorite photograph of the spacecraft. This is a picture taken with the famous 200-inch telescope on Palomar Mountain, and that's Deep Space One. And this picture was taken uh, <laughs> when Deep Space One was nine times farther away than the moon is. And this streak here doesn't tell you anything about the shape of the spacecraft. The reason for that is the telescope was tracking the stars, and of course the spacecraft had its own independent motion through the solar system, and so it's smeared out a little bit. And I personally, again, this is my favorite picture of the spacecraft, I think it's really cool that humankind can send spacecraft deep into space, out into the cosmos, and I think it's also cool that we can get pictures of it. And you know, this sort of thing is, is not just the product of the people at JPL and its collaborators who are fortunate enough to work on it. In my view, this is, a, this is a product of humankind. I think everybody participates in something like this, and, and I personally think it's very inspiring and, and really exciting. And at the time this picture was taken, just to give you an idea of how distant and faint this little spacecraft was, this is approximately visual magnitude 22.5 for you astronomers and for the rest of us. It means it's about four million times fainter than what you would be able to see with your naked eye. So I think that's a pretty cool picture. So now let's get back to Dawn. This is the spacecraft, and it's going to do the TIE fighters one better because it has three ion engines. Here's one here, here's a second one, and there's another one on the back. Large antenna, which will be used to send the scientific information back from Vesta and Ceres to Earth. And large solar arrays, which, as on most spacecraft, convert sunlight into electricity. That electrical power is used to operate the ion propulsion system and the rest of the spacecraft. And these solar arrays are really huge. The uh, full extent here from tip to tip is almost 20 meters, or nearly 65 feet, which, as some of you know from the beginning of the, uh, when we were getting set up here, 65 feet is the distance from the edge of the screen here to the back corner of the room there. And for those of you who are watching this in the webcast, it's wider than your computer screen. <clears throat> So this is going to be the largest span of solar rays for any spacecraft that NASA has ever sent into the solar system. And the reason it's so large is because the ion propulsion system is very power hungry. It needs a lot of electrical power. And we're sending the spacecraft far away from the sun, where sunlight then is not so abundant. 
And so when it's out at distant series, these arrays still need to produce enough electrical power to operate the ion propulsion system as well as the, the rest of the spacecraft. So let's take a look at some photos of the actual spacecraft instead of the artist's concept. Here it is uh, in its assembly facility at Orbital Sciences in Virginia. Here's that same large antenna now with a covering on it that's used to control the temperature when it's out in space. And the solar arrays are folded up here so that they'll fit inside the nose cone or the payload fairing of the rocket. And on top here are a number of scientific instruments and engineering subsystems. Down here at the bottom is one of the ion thrusters. We can take a, another close-up look at that. So here's the actual thruster. And there are about 15,000 little holes in this one-foot diameter grid. And that's the, those are the holes through which the xenon will be accelerated. And it sits on a support structure here, which allows the spacecraft to tip and tilt the thruster to point it in the direction that it needs. <clears throat> and I think people often sort of forget that, you know, you look at a spacecraft and it kind of looks cool on the outside, but there's a lot of stuff inside to make it work. Just shows this one view, which is, has a lot of cabling and other systems, but mostly what you're seeing here is a subset of the plumbing that's required to get the xenon from the tank, which is inside here, to the thruster. And before I go on to the next picture, I want to point out that I told you that the ion propulsion system comes from what we, what we have experience with with Deep Space One. Much of the spacecraft design, both the structure and the, the electrical systems, uh, come from other spacecraft that Orbital Sciences Corporation has built. And by taking advantage of designs from previous spacecraft, again, it saves you and me as taxpayers some cost. <clears throat> But I want to um, <clears throat> want to get back to the xenon now and show you a photograph of xenon. This is actually my pet chameleon xenon, <laughs> and uh, he I think has a sort of a personal interest in ion propulsion for, as you can see, cosmetic reasons. <laughs> this is again another view of the spacecraft. Here it is in the background. There, here's this big antenna which doesn't have the cover on yet. Just to give you a sense of the size of the solar array, each individual wing is 27 feet long. Again, when the two of them are together with the spacecraft in between, it's almost 65 feet. <clears throat> so I think spacecraft are pretty cool things, and I think people like you know, sort of looking at them and thinking about them. But what I think is cooler than the spacecraft themselves is what are these things doing? Where do spacecraft go? And, you know, how, let's. Think about the context. And, and in fact, spacecraft are going far from home, far from our home planet. So let's put that in context. This is low Earth orbit on the scale of the size of Earth. And you can see it's not very far away. And this is where many spacecraft and, right now, humans go. The International Space Station is in an orbit not too different in height from that. It's not very far away from Earth. In fact, the distance from the surface of Earth to low Earth orbit is comparable to the distance from here to San Diego. It's not really that far away. Now, many spacecraft go farther than low Earth orbit, though. Communication satellites, many communication satellites anyway, and some weather satellites and others go to what's called geosynchronous orbit, and that's at this distance. And you can see that that's now starting to get to be kind of far away compared to the size of our own planet. This is starting to feel a little bit more like we're really out in space. And the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of spacecraft that humankind has sent away from Earth have gone to geosynchronous orbit or to some lower orbit. But now let's put this in a little bit larger perspective. Let's bring the Earth down here, reestablish geosynchronous orbit, and now let's bring the Moon in and put it up at the distance that it belongs. So now the Moon is here about a quarter of a million miles away from Earth or 30 times Earth's diameter away. And you can see most of the satellites that we send out, they're not even getting anywhere near the distance to the moon. So, so spacecraft that go beyond the moon are really, I think, pretty special. And in fact, dawn will pass the moon's orbit 
the day after it launches. And in fact, in just a little bit more than half a year, it'll be 400 times farther away than the moon is from Earth. It'll be at that time uh, about the same distance than the sun, a little bit farther than the sun is. And I think that's pretty cool when you think about it. When you think about the sun, the same sun which has shone down on our planet for four and a half billion years, the same sun that's responsible for all the energy that we have on the planet, and, or most of it anyway, and that has influenced us you know, in so many ways, not just physical but culturally, to be able to send spacecraft out beyond that, I think is really something remarkable. And in fact, during its mission, dawn will be almost four times farther than the sun, 1,500 times the distance from the Earth to the moon. And in fact, <clears throat> on previous project I worked on when the spacecraft was on the other side of the sun, as corny as it actually sounds, went outside and blocked out the sun with my thumb and thought, gosh, we, again, humankind, this is something that all of us do, we're, we've got a spacecraft out there on the other side of the sun. I think that's something really remarkable, and I think that that's a lot of what many people, I think, at JPL find to be so rewarding about working on things like this. So how are we going to get out there? Well, we're going to start with a rocket. This is the, called the Delta 7925H and has nine strap-on solids down here that will work with the first stage to get the rocket off the launch pad and partway into space. And then this part will drop away, and the second stage will carry the third stage in dawn up to low Earth orbit, where it will spend just a few minutes. And then the second stage will finish its job and release the third stage that will send dawn out on its way, and then dawn will take, out, take over, do the rest of the mission on its own. Of course, it hasn't launched yet, so I'll show you a movie from a different mission. There's a sort of a space geek requirement that you have to show a video of a launch. This is from a JPL mission that went to Mars. And here's a camera on the rocket looking down at the pad, and you can see the bright glow from these solid rocket motors as the rocket lifts off from the ground. And up here, you can see the shadow of the rocket's contrail. It's the shadow of it on the ground at Space Launch Complex 17 at Cape Canaveral, the same place from which Dawn will launch. And now here, a little bit into the flight, some of these solid motors are going to fall away. There go some of them. There goes some more. A little bit later, now we're on a camera here looking down this way, and we'll see the first stage separate from the second stage. There the engine is still firing. It's going to tail off in a second. There it stopped, and now this whole stage falls away. It exposes the second stage motor. This thing will fire up and push itself away from that. Now we'll see a shutter in a second. There it shuttered as the nose cone or the payload fairing falls away, and there it goes into the background. And now we're on a camera looking up toward the third stage spacecraft. It's spinning it up pushes it away with springs, and there goes the third stage and the spacecraft. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for you amateur photographers, I'll give you a piece of advice, and that is don't let a spin rocket get in the way of your subject. That's just bad luck. But it turns out it doesn't matter because the signal from the camera is going to be lost before the third stage fires anyway, so that's okay. So the rocket then has put the spacecraft up into space, and now we'll continue with another view of the mission. So here it is after having separated from the launch vehicle with the solar arrays stowed together. Let's take a quick look around the spacecraft. There's, again, the ion thruster. There's one underneath there. Here's another on the back. And now we're going to zoom in and look at how the solar arrays are held together. The people that made this animation think are of the opinion that the most fascinating thing about spacecraft is how solar arrays uh, are opened up. So it turns out they're held, together, hold, held closed with a cord that has tension on it, hold, keeping springs from opening the solar array. And a mechanism here uh, will release the cord like that, and then the springs on the solar array will allow it to open up. And there are springs on these joints here pushing the solar arrays out so that then they can be fully exposed to the sun and this uh, this guy can convert its sunlight into electrical power and a nice reflection there of its home planet. 
<clears throat> excuse me, as it's, about, as it's about to leave. And so this will happen before we even hear from the spacecraft after launch. And then the operations team will spend a few months checking it out, and just for fun, here's, the, here's Orion in the background, belt and sword. So we'll spend a little while checking out the spacecraft, making sure that it's operational and ready for its, its journey through the solar system. And a few months after launch, will fire up the ion propulsion system. So here's a close-up of the thruster, and you can see a little bit of gimbling there, repointing it. The engine comes on. My pet chameleon's happy with the glow there. And then the spacecraft begins its propulsive journey, or its powered flight, on out to Mars and beyond to Vesta. And so it will spend thousands of days thrusting in order to, to accomplish its mission. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what it's doing there is reshaping its orbit around the sun in order to be able to get up to Vesta and, and drop into orbit around it. So there's Vesta as it, the spacecraft is approaching. <clears throat> so the spacecraft will continue operating its ion propulsion system to bring it down into orbit and you know, this has kind of a funny view on this projector. It almost looks like raindrops hitting the surface. I don't think that's exactly going to happen. I, in fact, I, I don't know what we're going to find when we get there. I think whatever it is will be much more intriguing than any artist can imagine. But it will be revealed by the spacecraft using its instruments to scan the surface to make the sort of measurements that we talked about earlier, this comparative planetology, understanding the surface and the subsurface, the really understanding how this thing works as a planetary type body. And then when it's finished, it'll just have a last look back as it turns on its ion propulsion system again, leaves Vesta to begin its journey to Ceres where it'll do the same sort of thing. And, <clears throat> excuse me, again, this, this kind of mission would not be possible without ion propulsion. In fact, it wouldn't even be possible to rendezvous with just one of Dawn's targets, either one of the targets, if we used a conventional propulsion system within NASA's constraints. So if we didn't use ion propulsion and we just wanted to go to Vesta, which is actually the easier of the two targets to reach, we would need something like two and a half tons of chemical propellants instead of just a few hundred pounds of xenon. Really a tremendous difference. In addition, we need an entirely new spacecraft structural design. And I mentioned earlier, we take advantage of the fact that Orbital Sciences Corporation has a spacecraft structure that can work with the, the amount of propellant that we're using and the size of the tanks. But we would lose that if we had to use a conventional propulsion system. In addition, <clears throat> we'd have to use a high energy version of the Atlas V rocket instead of the Delta II that we're using. And to give you a sense of the scale here, this is the height of the Delta II rocket. This is something else whose height you may sort of have a sense of. And that's the height of the Atlas V that would be required if we were just going to go to Vesta with conventional chemical propulsion. And it would truly be impossible with current technology and currently available rockets to design a mission that would go to Vesta and Ceres without ion propulsion. So this really makes a huge difference in what we're <clears throat> excuse me, what we're planning to do. So now let's take another look at, at, at where we're going. There's another view of the solar system. So here's again the sun in the center. This is the orbit of Earth. And here's about where Earth will be this summer when the spacecraft launches. And as we follow along the trajectory here, the black portion of the trajectory indicates where the spacecraft is coasting. And this xenon blue shows where it's thrusting with the ion propulsion system. So we'll coast for a few months after launch, as I mentioned, as we're sort of checking out the spacecraft, getting things ready. And then we'll spend some time thrusting, and for a variety of reasons, we'll coast a few times as we work our way around the solar system. And then we'll coast through the flyby with Mars here in early 2009. Continue on past that, fire up the ion propulsion system again, and continue around as we just climb out to Vesta and meet up with Vesta here late in 2011. We'll go into orbit around it. Then we stay with Vesta as it orbits the sun 
making our measurements. And then in 2012, we'll turn on the ion propulsion system again to leave Vesta orbit and begin the long climb out to Ceres, which we'll reach in 2015. We'll go into orbit there, and then we'll follow Ceres orbit around studying it. And the mission will end with the spacecraft here in orbit around Ceres. And these sort of static views of the solar system, I think, really don't capture the complexity of what's going on because, of course, there's a lot more in motion than just the spacecraft. Everything is moving. And so let's take another look at this. Here's Earth at launch, the spacecraft now climbing away. It's targeting Mars, and it will catch up with it over here. You can see Vesta and Ceres are continuing around the sun there. It flies by Mars. And now we're aiming for Vesta, and it's thrusting with its ion propulsion system <clears throat> Excuse me, to get it out to Vesta's orbit. And then when we get to about here, it gets into orbit around Vesta. Now it's making its measurements there. After seven or eight months, it leaves Vesta, begins the long climb out to Ceres. But remember, it's working now to tilt its orbit, and it's taking a lot of work of that ion propulsion system, years of thrusting, to arrive at Ceres orbit just at the right time that Ceres is there and gets into orbit, and that's the mission. So that's what's going to come up after launch. And uh, to get to launch, we still have a little bit more work to do. We're going to send the spacecraft to Cape Canaveral in April. Spacecraft testing will finish there. We'll load xenon propellant in May. We'll connect the spacecraft to the launch vehicle in June. And then our launch period is June 20th to July 10th. And obviously, we have a lot of other stuff coming up between now and, uh, and when we launch. But that's just a few things to focus on. Uh, and so um, I hope you'll, hope you'll follow the mission as we get started this summer, as we explore the solar system with Dawn. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, could you tell them to open the curtains? Open the curtains? Yeah, leave them open. Well, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. What, what altitude above the asteroid will uh, um, the spacecraft orbit? The question was, what altitude above the asteroids will the spacecraft orbit? And at each body, we're going to be in a number of different orbits. Uh, the flexibility of the ion propulsion system allows us to change the orbits a lot. But the lowest that will be at Vesta is about 200 kilometers, uh, or um, just about 130 miles, which actually is very low. I mean, that's like low Earth orbit here. So we're really going to be hoping there aren't any tall trees there. We're really going to be getting a good view. At Ceres, we won't get quite that low. The lowest altitude will be about 700 kilometers, or 450 miles. We could, in principle, go lower. One of the reasons that we don't, however, is because of the possibility of there being water at Ceres, it actually has biological interest. And so to protect this, um, this place where there could be prebiotic chemistry occurring, we don't want to go to an orbit so low where there'd be a risk of eventually the spacecraft crashing and contaminating the surface. Uh, the question was, is there a plan to fly it away from Ceres at the end? And there currently is no such plan. Uh, that isn't to say that we couldn't formulate such a plan, but the funding that NASA has, is planning to provide is enough to accomplish just the objectives which I described. And so the current plan is to leave the healthy spacecraft in that orbit at the end. How much danger is there of another asteroid colliding with the spacecraft? The question was, how much danger is there with another asteroid colliding with the spacecraft? And of course, we're flying through the asteroid belt, and I showed you 10,320 dots, at least, and every one of those dots, in principle, would be a threat. But it turns out that the, um, although that's a lot of, a lot of things out there, um, at least all of those we know about. Anything larger than a, f or most things larger than a few kilometers out there have been discovered, or at least many of them. Uh, the real risk is from very, very tiny particles. Uh, and uh, people, including a gentleman who's in the audience now, uh, who are really experts in the, the number of those particles and what their velocities are 
uh, as well as what their effects on the spacecraft are. People have really worked hard to study this, not just for Dawn, but for other spacecraft as well. And part of the principle of designing the spacecraft is to protect it from the inevitable impacts from these little so-called micrometeoroids that are in the solar system. And so I think the probability that it will be damaged is very, very low. I have a, a question about the little the ion propulsion. Um, it, it seems like you have uh, first a layer with a positive charge and then a layer with a negative charge, or a, a grill with a positive charge and then a negative charge. And you have the positive ions which are being forced past the, the positive layer. And the que I have two questions about that. First of all, why aren't they being actually just captured by the negative layer after that? And then the second one is, um, could you elaborate on how they're getting such a high net velocity gain since they actually have to be forced past it in the first place? And then obviously it'll accelerate afterwards, but a certain amount of energy has to be put into it to get it to the gate to begin with. Okay, I'm going to summarize that question uh, and give you a short answer. Now, the, the details of that answer, it sounds like perhaps you have a technical background, and I could give you a more detailed answer afterwards. But in brief, the question is, as you recall in the ion thruster, there are two grids, and the inner grid has a positive charge, and yet we have positively charged ions inside. So how do those, since like charges repel, how do those positively charged ions ever even get through the grid ultimately to get out of the thruster? Is that a fair um, summary of the question? Yes, summary of the first part. Summary of the first part. And uh, again, we could talk in more detail afterwards, but one way to think of it is that that first grid um, is, is positive only relative to the other grid. And so the ions that are inside don't see that as a repulsive force. What they see is the difference in the voltage, the difference in the electrical potential between the two grids. And so the acceleration that occurs occurs because of the fact that one plate is just at a voltage much higher than the other. And it's the force that acts on the charged particles between those two grids, separated by 660 or so microns, that provides the velocity. And the electric field is configured such that, in some sense, the ions are focused through the holes. And that's what gets them out. I know that's a pretty rough explanation. I'd be happy to talk to you in more detail afterwards. Um, lady in the back. Mm -hmm. How long will it take the information to get transmitted back to Earth from um, the two um, sites? The question was, how long will it take the information to get transmitted back from Vest and Ceres to Earth? And of course, the reason it takes time at all is because these are radio signals. Radio travels at the universal limit of the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. Uh, and so it doesn't travel infinitely fast. At the greatest distance, from Earth to Ceres, it'll take um, about 35 minutes for a radio signal to go from Dawn's antenna down to the antennas on Earth. Mm -hmm. How fast does the spacecraft accelerate? And, and can you vary that acceleration? Or is there just one, <coughs> one thrust? OK, the question was, how fast does the spacecraft accelerate? And can we vary it? We, do, we can vary it, and indeed we do. I'll tell you why in a second after I answer the first part of your question. The s speed of the spacecraft changes by, varies during the mission, but up to about 15 miles per hour per day. That's an acceleration. That's why I mentioned at the beginning that it would take four days to go from zero to 60 miles per hour. We do vary the acceleration, and the reason for that is because as the spacecraft recedes from the sun, there's less electrical power available. I mean, we still we have these big solar arrays, but at the distance of Ceres, even those big solar arrays are not enough to produce the maximum power that the ion propulsion system can accept. And so we throttle the ion propulsion system down as the spacecraft recedes from the sun to account for the fact that we have less electrical power available. And so the, the acceleration decreases during the mission. Uh, this gentleman. As the spacecraft approaches uh, Vesta, it's going faster, basically, in order to catch Vesta. How soon do you have to turn on the ion reverse uh, momentum to slow it down so it's captured, or not even captured, it gets into the circular orbit around Vesta? And the question was about the fact that as the spacecraft approaches Vesta, we have to sort of catch up with Vesta and 
perhaps turn the thrust around to slow down to get captured into orbit? How does all that work, and what is the timing there? And the, the way people normally think about this is the way most spacecraft, including Cassini there and a Mars spacecraft back in the corner, is you come screaming into the planet at high velocity, and you fire that engine to slow down to get captured into orbit. But with the ion propulsion system, it doesn't work that way. And so the, the way you would think about it, and the, the way, obviously, you are thinking about it that gave rise to the question, turns out not to be quite right. We don't come screaming in at high velocity and slow down with the ion propulsion system to get captured. Instead, those years of thrusting that I showed you that precede it are reshaping Dawn's orbit around the sun, sort of sculpting it or changing it, so that it's turning Dawn's orbit into one that just matches Ceres or Vesta's orbit or Ceres orbit. And so with the ion propulsion system, you, you shouldn't think of it as coming in and turning the thruster around. Instead, if this is Vesta going around the sun, or maybe I should say this is Vesta going around the sun, that, the spacecraft just creeps up next to it, catches up very gradually with it, just sort of nudges itself into orbit. And so there isn't a discrete event where you have to turn the thruster around and, and break into orbit. Mm -hmm. Do you have any opportunities for lucky flybys of other asteroids? Uh, the question was, will we, have a, will we have any opportunities for lucky flybys of other asteroids? And I guess the short answer is, if we're lucky, we will. Um, <laughs> We will, as, as all missions that are uh, transiting the asteroid belt, we will look in a, a, along the trajectory. We will, when we get the final, after the spacecraft has been launched, we know what day it's been launched, and we've determined the exactly final trajectory, we will analyze that trajectory to see whether we could have the opportunity to come near any other asteroids. And if we do, we most certainly would take advantage of that. It turns out, though, that because of the flexibility of the ion propulsion system, unlike conventional missions, the dates that we may arrive at Vest and Ceres can change by many, many months. You know, when a, a mission that is launched that's going to Mars or Jupiter or Saturn, when those are launched, they know to within a day when the spacecraft is going to get there. But it changes with the ion propulsion system. It depends on the details of how well does the solar array work, how much electrical power does the rest of the spacecraft consume. There's so much maneuvering done by the spacecraft that the details of the trajectory really are, won't be pinned down until we're actually in flight. We've characterized the spacecraft a little better. And then when we know exactly what its trajectory will be, again, we'll look to see whether we'd have the opportunity for any bonus flybys. Mm -hmm. um, I have never been to Cirrus before. Um, um, how do you know that one in five meteorites comes from Cirrus? Uh, the question was, and it's actually Vesta. Uh, having never been there before, how do we know that um, 1 in 20, or about 5% of the meteorites come from it? And the, the way that that was determined is through the um, scientific process called spectroscopy, where you break light up like a prism. When you look through a prism, you don't see white light. You see white, the white light broken up into its component colors. And if you break it up really finely, you can see the signatures of different materials that give off the light. And so if we looked at the lights here, for example, with a spectrometer, we could actually tell something about the, the composition of the material that's giving off the light. And so when scientists apply that, that technique to Vesta, they can learn something about the composition of its surface. And it turns out to be a remarkable match for the, same, for the spectrum of these meteorites that they have in the lab. And because I didn't want to bore you with graphs, I didn't include it. But it's actually pretty cool to look at the plots of the spectrum. That is, what's the intensity of the light at every different individual wavelength from Vesta and from these meteorites? And the match is really remarkable. And, and that's why it's believed that they, they come from that body. Mm -hmm. Talk about the, the solar rays on the craft. Um, of course, you get way out there, you're not getting too much sun coming. Uh, how much of the craft's energy is reliant on those panels? Uh, the question was that I talked about these large solar arrays and that when we get far away from the sun, they don't produce as much electrical power, and so how much of the spacecraft is reliant on the solar arrays? And the answer is 100%. That is, the spacecraft is going to be in flight for eight years, and so the battery that's on board only has enough energy to 
support the spacecraft from the time that it's on the launch pad and closed in the rocket's nose cone where there isn't sunlight impinging on the solar rays until it's up in space an hour or so later with the nose cone off and the solar ray extended, the battery would only last for an hour or two. So for the rest of the mission, it's fully dependent on the sunlight falling on the arrays. And that's the way it is with all of our spacecraft. They, they have to carry their own energy source. If they are going farther away than about where Dawn is going, they use a radioactive power source. That's what these two spacecraft use. And all others use uh, solar arrays. Mm -hmm. The gentleman on the end actually had his hand up first, I think. What instruments are on board and why three ion engines? Um, it's two questions. What instruments are on board and why three ion, three ion engines? There are um, three different kinds of scientific instruments, or sorry, four different kinds of scientific instruments on board. There's a uh, basically a digital camera that will allow us to take color pictures, and the details of the color are it's more comprehensive than the digital camera that you have. The colors are sort of matched to what interesting minerals we expect to see. This camera is contributed to the Dawn mission, contributed to NASA by uh, organizations in Germany. There's a spectrometer, the, pro the phenomenon I was just talking about, something that breaks the light up so that we can measure what the individual uh, minerals are on the surface. Uh, that's provided to us by Italy. There's another spectrometer that instead of measuring uh, visible or infrared light, like that spectrometer does, measures gamma radiation, which is a, sort of like x-rays but higher energy, and also measures neutrons, subatomic particles, that are coming from the surface that carry the signature of individual elements. And there's a system on board that allows us to use the radio signal connecting the spacecraft with Earth to make very, very accurate measurements of the gravity of the body, and that's how we infer the internal structure. And as for why we have three ion thrusters, it's because there's a process that I won't take the time to describe here, although if you care, I could tell you afterwards, where the thruster actually wears out as it expends propellant. And we carry 400, a little more than 400 kilograms or a little more than 900 pounds of xenon, and that's more than any one thruster can expend. It really would take at least two thrusters to do that, and so we carry three, always wanting to have a backup. And the gentleman next to you also had a question. This is a, actually relative to going back to your introduction. You made the point with regard to the enabling technology of uh, the ion propulsion, but I was also struck by the fact that there must have been some enabling technology to have this sudden burst of finding of new uh, planets, so-called, in the early 1800s. What was that new technology that permitted that increase in uh, knowledge at that particular point? Uh, the question is, what was responsible for the, what was the technological innovation that led to this burst of discovery of asteroids at the beginning of the 19th century? And it actually was uh, something that is not entirely fully understood now. I didn't, didn't want to get into the details of it here, but there was a mathematical principle that described the locations of planets, a simple mathematical relation that says, you know, there should be, or not should be, there are, from Mercury to Uranus, there are planets at these specific distances from the sun. And yet this mathematical relationship said there should be a planet between Mars and Jupiter. And so Piazzi's discovery wasn't just accidental. It wasn't just that he happened to be you know, gazing in the sky and discovering that nice body. He was actually part of a group that was out looking for, uh, for new bodies. And so there was a concerted effort uh, early in the 19th century to find these things. Now, of course, there also was the gradual improvement in the, the quality of telescopes, as well as another, uh, there was one more thing going on, and that was the technology of mathematics. In fact, when Piazzi discovered uh, Ceres, he got just a few glimpses of it, but it was another fellow, I think it was Gauss, who actually used Piazzi's measurements to predict what, or to, to, to determine what Ceres orbit was, so that then people could go back and look at a future time and say, oh yeah, it's over there now, as opposed to just having had a few observations and then losing track of it. <laughs> 
So it was a number of things that came together like that in order to allow this, this advancement. Anything else? Okay. Um, on the on the, the Dawn spacecraft, the, the solar arrays are they uh, are they also gimbaled like the engines, or are they fixed? Okay, the question was whether the solar arrays are gimbaled, or that is, can they be moved like the ion engines, or or are they fixed? And they are gimbaled in one sense, like the ion engines, or in fact, in one dimension. That is, I happen to have an, a model of the spacecraft here. I'm it. Here are the solar arrays, and they can be rotated like this to keep them pointed toward the sun. So as the spacecraft rotates like that, the solar rays can be tipped to keep them, keep them pointed at the sun. Mm -hmm. Your theoretical drawing of the structure of Ceres had um, conductive and convective ice. What's that? What's yeah. the difference? <laughs> um, again, that's something where, if you'd like, we could, if you have a technical background, we could talk about it in more detail afterwards. But they're both ice. That's just describing the different processes by which heat moves around inside the asteroid. That is, it can move by conduction or convection. The ice itself can actually sort of flow inside the body. And it's just referring to that. Anything else? Well, if there aren't any other questions, again, appreciate your coming to JPL, and thanks for watching on the web.